Okay, so we left off talking about the coelom, uh, the body cavity. So I, I made a, a couple of little edits there. So a body cavity is a coelom. An acelomate has no coelom. A pseudocelomate has a pseudocelom or a body cavity not completely lined by mesoderm. And a coelomate has a coelom, which is a body cavity fully lined by mesoderm. So just put the terms in there a little bit so that it's all... Uh, copacetic. Now, here's a good picture of the different types of body cavities. So here we see a acelomate, and here's your external body tissues, and then here's mesoderm, and it's a giant solid mass of mesoderm, and then the yellow stuff is the digestive organs. And then we'll skip down to the bottom to talk about the pseudocelomate. Here's the external covering there, then the red mesoderm, and then the white space is our hollow body cavity, and then the yellow stuff is our digestive tract. So the body cavity is not fully lined by mesoderm. What does that mean? Let's look at the coelomate where it is fully lined by mesoderm. Here's the digestive tract, and then you can see a big layer of mesoderm around it. So this white hollow body cavity has mesoderm all around it. So fully lined by mesoderm. So that's what we mean when we refer to something as acelomate, no body cavity, pseudocelomate, a body cavity that isn't lined by mesoderm fully, and coelomate, which is a body cavity fully lined by mesoderm. So uh, think of mesoderm as connective tissue and muscle is your best bet for when you're envisioning mesoderm. So, bam. All right, so now we were going to talk about mollusca. Mollusks are snails, slugs, clams, mussels, squids, and octopus. Uh, they show bilateral symmetry, and they have all three types of tissues, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. Remember, jellyfish did not have mesoderm. Having all three types of tissues, they also have uh, a digestive tract, a complete digestive tract, meaning that it has two openings. They are a coelomate, meaning they have the full-on body cavity lined by mesoderm, and they are soft-bodied, um, meaning that uh, their body is very soft tissue. Um, so uh, they don't have an exoskeleton or anything like that, but a lot of them have hard protective shells made of calcium uh, carbonate that they secrete. Um, so the shell of a clam is actually secreted around the soft body of the clam. It's not actually a skeleton. It's just a mineral kicked out of the skin of the clam. So let's take a look at some of the physical features common to all mollusks. All mollusks have the radula, which is a rough structure, which is tongue-like, and scrapes food into the mouth. Ow, ow. So it's kind of like sandpaper, uh, and it just scrapes at food and pulls it into the mouth. If you've ever had an aquarium and you've stared at a snail, they'll open their little mouth and scrape at the glass and open their little mouth and scrape at the glass. It's kind of cute. Anyway, uh, the body is divided into three main parts. The muscular foot which is for movement or attachment, the visceral mass, which is where all the organs are, and the mantle, which covers the visceral mass and secretes, if you're an organism that does it, secretes the calcium carbonate, the shell. So, let's take a look at class gastropoda. So, we are in Phylum Mollusca class Gastropoda. Gastropoda consists of the snails and the slugs. The snails have a single spiral shell protecting the body. Um, and then we have slugs and sea slugs, which do not have a shell. Uh, gastropods have a distinct head, usually with little uh, two to four to six antennae sticking off, sensing the environment around them. Um, and they have eyes on the end of those little stalks. So I guess I used antennae. That's wrong. Antennae aren't 
for eyes, so they're they're eye stalks. They have eyes on the tip of the stalks. So when you look at a snail and it comes out of its shell and it puts those two little things up, those are its eyes on the tip of stalks. Uh, Seventy-five percent of all mollusks fall into the class gastropoda, the snails and the slugs and the sea slugs. There's a lot of them. And here's a few pictures. Here's an adorable giant snail getting a bath. Uh, and then here's a common garden slug. You might see a banana slug, I think, quite big. This is a sea slug, very bright and beautiful. A lot of sea slugs are gorgeous animals. And then this is a really cool kind of sea slug. Uh, and uh, it's just neat. I thought I'd throw it in there because it just looks kind of like a jet plane or something from the future. Like it should be in a Final Fantasy game or something. Anyway, uh, next up is class bivalvia. So the bivalves. So now we're in phylum mollusca, class bivalvia, bivalves. These are the clams and the mussels. They have a shell and it's in two parts and they're hinged together, which is why we call them bivalves. Bi, two, whoop. Uh, so they have no radula um, and most are sedentary, meaning they don't really move around. They use their muscular foot to dig in the sand and or anchor to surfaces and then they just kind of stay there. So here is a clam uh, on the beach. Here's a clam that's been uh, dissected open a little bit. We can take a look at some stuff here. The stuff right up against the shell here is the mantle. So it's right attached to the shell. And that mantle has secreted the shell. This big thing here is our muscular foot for digging into sand or attaching onto surfaces. Then this mass right here is the visceral mass. Um, so here is Another picture of a bivalve showing uh, water flowing in and passing across the gills and flowing out. That's the mantle cavity there. Then we have the giant visceral mass here. And then we have the head and the mouth and an eye. And this is the foot of the organism. And then the rest of this is shell. So this is another bivalve. This is a limpet. Anyway. Uh, next up is class cephalopoda. This is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite kinds of animals, the cephalopods. So, phylum mollusca, class cephalopoda. Cephalo means head, po pod means foot. So they're the head foot organisms. And these are squid and octopus. And a number of things separate squid and octopus out from other mollusks. One of them being that these are incredibly intelligent organisms that have the ability to communicate with each other using gestures and uh, even colors, uh, light patterns. Uh, squids have 10 tentacles, eight normal tentacles, and then these two hunting or grabbing tentacles that are very long and they keep them coiled up inside the rest of their tentacles and then every once in a while when they see a fish they'll shoot them out and grab it and then pull it in. Octopus have eight tentacles all for hunting and squid and octopus are totally awesome. They have no shell except for the nautilus which is a cool cephalopod I'll mention. Um, and they have extremely well-developed brains, eyes, and propulsion systems. Squids have fins at the rear for swimming along. And then they also have this uh, little opening um, right in their mantle cavity. Uh, and it can squirt water out. So they have a strong muscle there. They can contract it to shoot water out. And when they shoot water, 
they sort of jet propel themselves. So octopus walk on their tentacles and they use their mantle for jet propulsion. And both squid and octopus can secrete ink when in danger. So they can secrete a black, cloudy, pigmented gunk uh, to cloud up the water and prevent uh, prey predators from finding them. And then they also use their tentacles for hunting their prey. And they have their radula inside a sharp bird-like beak. So they're all sorts of cool, way different from freaking snails, slugs, and clams and mussels. So here's a whole bunch of pictures. This top left is a squid. We can see the two fins at the rear here. And these are the eight tentacles there that are involved in gripping and maneuvering food. And then these long ones here are the hunting tentacles that this squid is shot at to grab onto something. Um, this is an octopus walking along the beach. Down here, these two pictures at the lower left are the nautilus. The nautilus is the only cephalopod with a shell. You can see it has a lot of tentacles. Um, the nautilus is one of the most primitive organisms. You can also see based on its eye that it's a very primitive eye. The nautilus lives in the deep, deep oceans. And uh, it's an evolutionary remnant from a time when all cephalopods had shells. Nautilus is the only remaining species of cephalopod with a shell. Here's a very colorful octopus over here, mid-right. And then lower right is an octopus uh, showing off its ability to alter coloration and body texture. So you can see it camouflages. This is not photoshopped in any way. It's literally an octopus camouflaging. Pretty awesome. And then this picture up here, top right, and then sort of the middle picture here, are of a kind of organism called a cuttlefish. The cuttlefish is a cephalopod with, uh, I think, ten tentacles, but uh, they're all sort of mid-sized. None of them are long hunting tentacles like a squid. And they have fins that run the entire length of their body. And cuttlefish are notable because they communicate with light. So this guy in the middle is showing off a communication pattern towards other cuttlefish to transmit some kind of message. And then the top right picture is just there because, darn it, that's adorable. So cuttlefish are adorable. All right, that is it for phylum mollusca. So next up is phylum platyhelminthes. Platyhelminthes are the flatworms. Flatworms show bilateral symmetry. They have all three tissues, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. They are a coelomate, meaning they have no body cavity. They're just a solid mass of mesoderm with the digestive organs suspended inside. And then we have a gastrovascular cavity, an incomplete digestive system, one opening. So flatworms can be free-living or parasitic. The free-living flatworms are known as planarians. So class planaria are the free-living flatworms. And they have a well-developed digestive system. It's still incomplete, but it's very well-developed for hunting prey uh, and picking up food. The parasitic flatworms have practically no digestive system. It's very simplified. Um, and instead of having a well-developed gastrovascular cavity that can digest nutrients, instead, they absorb their nutrients directly from their host. Depending on where they are, they'll absorb it from the digestive tract if they're living in the host's intestines, or from the blood if they're living in the host's blood vessels. Blood flukes are a kind of flatworm that lives in the blood vessels and the liver, and they absorb nutrients directly from the host's blood, so they have practically no digestive system. Tapeworms 
are a flatworm that live in the intestines of their host. And they, again, have practically no digestive system. Rather, they absorb the nutrients after you get finished breaking them down. So they just sort of steal your nutrients. They have a single head with little hooks for attachment and suckers to help them keep attached. And so when they get inside you, this tiny little head will attach onto the wall of your intestines. And then it will start absorbing nutrients. And as it absorbs nutrients, it produces little packets or segments. And this tail of the tapeworm is actually thousands of sections, thousands of little packets or segments, each containing male and female reproductive organs. Basically, the tiny microscopic head attaches to your intestine, and then the rest of the tapeworm is literally egg factories. So, uh, and the eggs are released in your fecal matter, so that anything that contacts the fecal matter or eats the fecal matter will pick up the tapeworm and then continue the cycle of parasitism. So these are some planarians free living little organisms with eye spots, very simple eye spots for detecting light. Um, and so they can move around and they tend to move away from light and into shade. And they just have a stomach right here on the underside. So this is the mouth and the pharynx which can come out and sort of attach to whatever they're eating. And then it goes into this single digestive cavity, which is actually quite large. All this gray area with weird little bits, uh, squiggly bits coming off there, that's all the gastrovascular cavity. Um, and so very well developed digestive system. And then here's a cool little planarian on a leaf, a blade of grass. Here's a blood fluke that lives in your blood. Uh, this is the sucker for attaching to the inside of your veins or to your liver. Um, here's a microscopic picture showing that sucker a little bit better. Um, they're pretty nasty organisms. They get into you and they just reproduce. Um, so mature blood flukes tend to live in the blood vessels of the intestine. So after you finish digesting food in your intestine, it's absorbed into the blood vessels around the intestines. And then the blood flukes steal those nutrients. And then they reproduce inside the human. And then the eggs exit in the feces. And then they larvae infect snails, at which point they develop into a little free swimming larvae that can swim over and penetrate the skin of your feet or your hands to get into your blood vessels to continue the cycle of parasitism. Do you need to know this life cycle? No. Is it really interesting? Yes. What you need to know is a blood fluke is a parasitic flatworm that lives in blood vessels in your liver. Uh, then there's the tapeworm. So this here is a pork tapeworm, and this is the head right here. This little bit, and this is also another image of a pork tapeworm, and this is the head here. And then all this other stuff, all these segments here are all those individual little egg packets that make thousands upon thousands upon thousands of eggs. And tapeworms can get very, very, very long. You have 20 feet of intestines, and your tapeworm can be much more than 20 feet long. So it's pretty epic. Uh, so that's enough of Phylum platyhelminthes. Next up is Phylum annelida, but I think I've got, I, I think this has been long enough, so we'll pick up with annelids in the next video.